Uh, she's a trickster. The future is Thunderbird Women. This is uh, about my work. Um, I'd also like to acknowledge the Sami people and Sapmi, uh, the land of the Sami people where I've been um, graciously honored and accepted and um, they've shared much of their knowledge with me as well. So I'm grateful to be on their land. Who am I? Um, my name's Amanda Fayant, like Nelly said. I'm Cray, Cree Métis Soto artist and researcher from Treaty 4. I'm, I'm sharing a map of the prairies. And as you can see, Saskatchewan is, is in the middle. Treaty 4 covers sort of um, the bottom parts of those three provinces. So when I say I'm from Treaty 4, um, I say that because um, Treaty 4 was a document signed between many of the Indigenous groups in Alberta, Saskatchewan, and Manitoba uh, in relationship to the Crown. Um, and it is easier for me to acknowledge my relationship to the land and to other people um, through that relationship rather than through the colonial boundaries of Alberta, Saskatchewan, and Manitoba. So I don't only exist in Saskatchewan as a Cree Metis Soto person, but Treaty 4 covers all three provinces. And so in that way, um, I'm going back to to as close as I can to referring to where I'm from, from an Indigenous perspective. I'm from the lands covered in Treaty 4. I'll talk a little bit more about treaties after. Um, as you guys can read from that, I'm from here and my perspectives and relationships uh, have been tangled up in my identity. Um, I always have to start with part one, the Indian Act, <clears throat> because the Indian Act uh, began almost as soon as there was contact in Canada, and the Indian Act defines still to this day who we are as Indigenous peoples in Canada legally. So I can define myself as Cree, Métis, Soto, but in terms of the legal language in Canada, I am a non-status Indian and Métis person. Um, <clears throat> So I don't know if I need to read the whole screen here, but I'm just gonna go a little bit through it. 1857 to 1867 is uh, 1857, and this is sort of the time when they were really developing the words and the meaning behind um, the Indian Act. From 1857, women were treated disadvantagedly compared to men. And as you can see at the bottom, in 1867, the Indian Act defined an Indian as a male Indian child of a male Indian or the wife of a male Indian. So uh, right from the point of contact, Indigenous women became invisible, uh, became ha had no rights, had no rights to their land, had no rights to their family, and were no longer seen as leaders in their communities, which is what we had had before, I'm going to say, to the best of my knowledge. We can never know exactly what it was before, but I do know that our um, indig Indigenous this matriarchy is still very strong and was very strong before. Uh, so uh, on the left is um, a pictograph of the treaty of Treaty 4, which is a treaty that covers my land. It was, it was drawn by Chief Pasqua and as you can see in his drawing there are not there are no indigenous women. Um, and this drawing um, <clears throat> sort of illustrates the negotiation of the treaty. Uh, I took his drawing and I did my own drawing where I um, inserted Indigenous women where they would have actually been in the history of that negotiation because it, it is co completely false to think that Indigenous women would have not had some agency in their communities during those negotiations. Legally, only men could be sent to negotiate with the Crown because of colonial patriarchy. Uh, however, uh, it is highly unlikely that Indigenous women were not involved in the, in the, in the treaty behind the scenes. So I, I work very much to bring forward Indigenous women's leadership and roles in um, our history in Canada. Mm. Uh, so this is an artwork by uh, Chief Ladybird. Uh, she she's an amazing artist who does work like this. Um, and I think this really 
it uh, shows how the Indian Act imposed a break in matrilineal culture in indigenous communities. Uh, in 1957, Canada tried to uh, change the Indian Act to sound something a little bit better, it became Bill C-3. Um, and in this law, this is where it directly affected my family. Uh, um, um, uh, a w Indian woman who married a man who was not of a not a status Indian became non-status. So status and non-status, basically all that means is status, you've um, signed some papers and you've gone into agreement with the government and said that you belong to this reserve and you get a card saying you're a status Indian. So basically you just, um, you've gotten the approval of the government to be an indigenous person. <laughs> Uh, Non-status means you have not gone through that process. You're still indigenous. You can still be connected to a reserve. You can still have relations in those reserves, but legally the government does not see you as belonging to that reserve or having the rights of those people. Uh, and this especially affected indigenous women. Uh, in 1985, or sorry, they tried to change it again because in 1981 the United Nations uh, found that the loss of Indian women's status pursuant to Section 12.1b of the Indian Act violated the right to enjoy cultural life under uh, this case in Canada. Um, this and other pressures resulted in the Canadian government amending the Act. Um, and I personally think they make the Act, they add all these letters to numbers to make it sound more serious and also to confuse the matter because people wonder what does bill c31 what does that mean actually instead of before the indian act then you had an idea of what that meant bill c31 is quite uh, ambiguous to many people in canada who don't specialize in understanding indigenous history in our country um so um, Gwen Brodsky, who I've read a lot and quoted a lot from here, she writes, despite government promises, Bill C-31 continued to prefer descendants who trace their Indian ancestry along the paternal line over those who trace their ancestry along the maternal line. Uh, so for me, this meant that I had some, and still have some real life consequences or impacts, I guess I would say. Um, my status Cree grandmother married a non-status Métis man and lost her status to her reserve. That meant she also lost contact with her family on her reserve. She lost any rights to the land and she couldn't go back. My Métis grandfather passed away when my father was young and my grandmother remarried. The man she, re she married was a status Indian who belonged to a different reserve than she originally had belonged to. Um, the only way she could regain status at the time was to take the status from my step-grandfather. Years later, when my sister applied for status, she had to apply for our step-grandfather's reserve, a land we have no connection to and people we are not related to. Meanwhile, my grandmother's real family is still living on their reserve, and we have little connection to them now. And these are our blood relatives on my grandmother's side. Um, and also, we have no possibility to pass on any kind of status to our daughters. Um, so the Indian Act is at the core of my work and I'm always questioning who's in control of our identity. Um, and so far the Indian Act still controls that um, in the government's eyes. Uh, I have a little graph that shows how it actually works legally. Uh, as you can see at the bottom, this is where it comes out quite disadvantagedly to women. Brother's grandchild is entitled to status under Section 6.2. Sister's grandchild is not entitled to status. So this means I can't pass on my, my indigenous status to my daughters. Um, and this means not only a loss of family, but it means loss of access to land. And as you will see later, land is where we um, create, expand, and share knowledge. So without access to that land, it is difficult to have access to um, an identity that you choose for yourself. Uh, part two is called Rematriate. Um, and I, this is named after an online campaign in Canada. Uh, and it's about indigenous women reclaiming agency. 
Um, we are opposed to the appropriation of our cultural identities. And the collective is an online visual arts and decolonization movement intended to move the conversation around indigenous women in the media into a more positive space by putting indigenous women themselves in charge of how they are portrayed. To do this, the collective goes straight to the source, indigenous communities where women are reclaiming their identities, self-expression, and traditional ways of life with contemporary methods. So for myself, as you can see, I have um, a face tattoo. This is me uh, reclaiming some of my Cree heritage. My sister is, uh, is um, an indigenous tattoo artist and she does it in the traditional way with poke or with sewing. So I have poke tattoos on my face and I also have sewing ta uh, sewed tattoos on my wrists. These are called my bracelets. Um, and these are just ways for indigenous women to define themselves in terms of strength and beauty. Uh, here's an example of another woman who's had skin stitching for her bracelet. Um, so I'll go into my artistic research now a bit. Um, what does it mean to be a researcher? Anyone who wants to write about a culture or a group of people and their language and customs, I think should reflect on this very much. Um, this isn't a question that belongs only to me. I think everyone needs to work with understanding this. Um, and especially coming from an indigenous community, what does the word research mean? What does it refer to? What is its history in our communities? How is research used to propagate colonial frameworks? And what is the story of research? Um, these are a lot of questions and things that I've written, I've read in this book here that I share, but also that I've reflected on in my own work. Um, Linda T. Smith wrote that uh, the word itself, research, is probably one of the dirtiest words in the indigenous world's vocabulary. Um, and she, she says this for a good reason, because the history of research has been extractive and has taken advantage of and has rewritten history from a colonial perspective. Um, she, um, she talks about relationality as a worldview and she goes on to write about indigenous research is a humble and humbling activity. This is something that's been very important to me and I carry it with me in my work. Uh, and I'm there to listen and observe and create space for indigenous women's knowledge. I'm not there to extract um, or take advantage of anybody else's experiences or knowledge. Another question that has, that is a, a huge part of my work. And also I would say as a child, even I grew up wondering about this, who owns knowledge? Um, owning knowledge is a powerful thing. When we recognize what we know and how we know it as a culture and as individuals, we can see the connections and locate ourselves within a larger narrative. In this way, we come back to sharing stories. Our stories are like pieces of the puzzle, pieces that need to connect and that belong in a place. Um, and this is something that Linda T. Smith writes about as well. And I really like what she says when she says, research is not a distant academic exercise, but an activity that has something at stake and that occurs in a set of political and social conditions. So I argue quite strongly with researchers or other people who try to connect themselves to the notion of being objective. As a participant in the process, it is impossible to be objective. And the idea of objectivity is an illusion, I believe. <clears throat> um, so a lot of people like to argue with me about that, but this is, I tend to think, I tend to, when I want to really just like sum it up really quickly for people, when they say, what's the difference between uh, you as an indigenous researcher or, and colonial impacts on research or things like that, I, I like to say that um, the academic lie or the <laughs> academic framework is very much connected to this idea of being objective which is not existent. And I say instead in an indigenous research practice, you acknowledge that you are not objective, 
and that you are subjective and a part of the process. And in that way, you're being actually more truthful than saying you're, you're objective and not related to the research. There's a reason you chose the question. There's a reason you chose the subject. There's a reason you're connecting yourself to whatever it is you're researching. So that is not objectivity. And I think it would be really hard to learn something objectively, but that's me from an indigenous perspective. Um, uh, so this is a little bit about when I was writing my master's thesis, I'm finished now, but I was really, I was really, I was really torn in two because I'm doing a master's thesis in an academic um, situation. However, it's an indigenous studies master's where we are taught to break these norms and work in different ways. So it's really hard for me to know what sort of language to use. Um, and another um, indigenous scholar, Onawa McIver said, she shared the same struggles. I struggled to begin this paper in the right way. And I think that that's what academia often is trying to trick people with is the right way to do things. Um, and in my indigenous research, um, that just doesn't seem to make any sense to me that what is a right way? What does that really mean? What is right? Which way do you mean? Um, so these sorts of things are what goes on in my head. Um, and as Linda Smith states, um, indigenous people want to tell our own stories, write our own versions in our own ways for our own purposes. Um, so a lot of times if I'm reading or sharing a text uh, with a class that's written uh, maybe with indigenous terms or, or indigenous words uh, from a language and it's not translated, um, I think that that's okay because sometimes it's for our own purposes and sometimes it's okay for others to feel outside of the knowledge you know and everybody doesn't always have to own everyone else's knowledge and the way i justify this is that when i was in school growing up i didn't i grew up in an indigenous way and um i often struggled at school to understand the colonial perspective and so many of the texts that i read i felt outside of and i didn't feel connected to and so I think it's okay that when Indigenous people want to tell our own stories, that we don't have to describe or explain every single little thing that we are doing with our work, because that is a part of the learning as well, and a part of feeling um, this, this, um, this magic of connection, the different ways that we can connect, also through not knowing. Uh, storytelling is really a big thing that I'm, that I, I don't really know how to express it. When I say stories, people think of uh, that it's like made up or fantasies, but actually stories in indigenous research are off, is a, has been a way to share knowledge over time, over a massive length of time, um, which is what the Vine Deloria article is referring to, uh, the one that we shared. Um, so I'm gonna go into the medicine wheel a little bit here, which is uh, the perspective that I grew up with. It starts from a story where the four directions blow and create the earth on the back of the turtle. Uh, I, can't go, I can't go too much into that story right now. I might have time for it later, but in essence, um, I, I like these quotes from these elders. Um, talking about what the medicine wheel is and people have often asked me what does medicine mean in an, in an indigenous way and I'm not talking about aspirins or tablets or things like this. This is medicine in terms of um, Yeah, I don't even know often how to explain it is is very difficult, but it's it's a good way a good perspective um, um, yeah, so they, these elders say um, the, the most important part of the medicine wheel is a circle. They call it a hoop. You can see it in the trunk of the tree, the nest, the world, and the sky. The circle is important in that it develops an energy that keeps flowing and building momentum. Energy can continue to flow around a circle forever. Sometimes we put a sick person in the middle of the circle. All of the people sitting around the circle are an equal distance from the person in the middle, and the energy focuses itself to the middle. You see, we all have a spirit and energy that is transferable. 
We also get energy from nature because all things that are alive, including rocks, have energy to depart. Um, and I like that these things are shared uh, in the spoken word from elders because this also repeats the way that we shared knowledge uh, from time. You had to know how to tell stories to share knowledge with your communities. And I often say that storytelling um, is entertaining, but not entertainment. That it is meant to engage, but it is not just meant to um, be a moment of entertainment. It is something that you're supposed to be learning from as well. <clears throat> um, the medicine wheel is a circular symbol representing the wholeness of traditional native life. It is a perfectly balanced shape without a top or bottom, length or width. It represents constant movement and change. It also represents and symbolizes unity, peace, harmony, and courage. It is a testimony of the human being's ability to survive and to maintain balance. <clears throat> the ultimate goal is to strike a harmonious balance in life. The circular form of the medicine wheel shows the relationship of all things in a unity, a perfect form, and suggests the cyclical nature of all relationships and interactions. Everything in the universe is part of a single whole. And this also relates to the article by Vine Deloria where he says, we are all related. And this is also something I grew up hearing constantly, that we are related to, to everything in terms of how we engage and um, interact. So this is also relating. Um, this, is an, this is a version of a medicine wheel that I'm working on uh, in order to also highlight um, the matrilineal culture. But traditionally, um, you have you have in the east is yellow. That's where the sun rises. In the middle is the individual self. Self. I've given some like academic terms to what the different aspects of the wheel can mean. Um, so the east is perceiving. It's the beginning. It's spring. It's it's life. The starting. Um, in the south is relating. Um, it's often blue or black, and is the time of understanding. Uh, the West is red, uh, and this is more about methodology and, and the emotional side um, and knowing and knowledge. And the North is the winter, um, and this is the time for um, protecting knowledge and, and not just knowing, but having a wisdom, which is a difference. This is the story of Thunderbird Woman and her eggs, and this is what was what the beginning of why I um, decided, uh, or what inspired me to work uh, with Indigenous women's stories. Um, long ago, a young woman fell in love with a Thunderbird. They eventually got married and had a family. She laid many eggs made of stone on top of a mountain where they lived. One day those eggs will hatch and baby Thunderbirds will come out and save the earth. Um, now this, this story itself has many layers for me because I grew up um, with my father having gone to a residential school. Um, in a residential school, they were not allowed to speak their language. They were not allowed to practice their culture. They were not allowed to see their family members or go home during holidays. So um, many of the children or all of the children who've been forced to go to residential schools um, lost their culture in some aspect. And it wasn't a choice to go to a residential school. There's something in Canada called the Residential School Act. And it was law that all Indigenous children had to go to these schools. And they were mostly run by Catholic um, priests and nuns. And if you didn't send your children, they would cut off the food to your reserve. So it was not a choice in any sense at all. Um, so for me, growing up, I had heard about the Thunderbirds because they're also called the four, they also live in the four directions. Um, and I had heard many stories about Thunderbird. I hadn't heard anything about Thunderbird Woman until I had seen this picture. Um, and this picture was made by Isaac Murdoch, the person who shared the story with me. And I was so um, enthralled and just like, obsessed with this picture of Thunderbird Woman. And so I asked him what was the inspiration. 
Um, and he was very gracious and shared the story that his grandmother shared with him. This had a lot of meaning for me. And this is also how we as indigenous people share our knowledge is that Isaac didn't, didn't say to me, this is my grandmother's story and I'm not gonna tell it to you and you can't share it with anybody. And instead, he, of course, this is a story for our people and this is for all of us. Um, and so he shared it with me and not only did he share it with me, he allowed me to share it in my thesis and he allowed me to share his work and was, um, and so for me, this is exactly the part about indigenous learning is that um, these stories help us learn from each other and uh, we don't, we don't tend to claim ownership over the stories. These are stories for all of us to learn from. And as I say to everybody in Canada, the stories of the land are the stories for everyone in Canada, not just the Indigenous people. You can't take away the knowledge that lives within the land. Uh, so in my thesis, I, I, um, I wrote about four Indigenous women working in their communities. Um, this is my sister. She's self-taught. She does traditional tattoo work. She does beading, Métis sashes. Uh, she sews traditional Métis clothing. And she does this in collaboration with her community and she shares all of her knowledge with, with all of the community. And when you give a, um, when she gives a tattoo, there's no exchange of money, it's a gift. So she won't just necessarily, you can't just call her up and say, I want this. <laughs> um, it has to be a gift. And this was the part about uh, the whole tattoo process that I really loved was the connection um, the physical touch, the trust that had to be involved between the two of us because it takes a, a great amount of time. Um, and so I noticed that, that there was a huge difference between um, the way tattooing has become so um, colonized in a sense that there's like, you, you don't really know the person who's doing it. You don't know, they don't know you. Um, there's not so much interaction. It can be, it can be a very strange experience. Um, Whereas it's the opposite for an indigenous tattoo experience. It can take many, many, many hours and you have to have a good relationship with the person you're with and they have to trust you and you have to trust them to allow you to do the artwork that you're going to do on their body. Um, so I was, I'm very inspired by my sister's work. Um, in addition, I met with um, a scholar, Sherry farrell Reset. Um, she's most known in my community for the book, The Flower Beadwork People. Um, and this had a lot to do with my identity growing up because as a Métis person, um, the Métis are a mix of um, indigenous and European culture. And um, in the at first, Métis were Cree and French. So the language is based in French and Cree words. Uh, so we have a language, it's called Michif. Um, but where I grew up, there was a lot of racism, unfortunately, and I did not have a good self view of what being indigenous or Métis meant until I saw, and I couldn't even really describe to people what Métis meant to, to what it meant to be Métis um, until I saw this book, The Flower Beadwork People. Um, and I just love the way Sherry describes it because that is the difference between Métis and Indigenous communities is that the Métis tended to bead in floral patterns, whereas Indigenous communities use geometric patterns in their beadwork. So this is why we were called, um, and she's a historian, so she got this term from back then, is that from way back then we were called the flower beadwork people because we beaded in these flower, um, flat flower patterns. Um, Sherry has worked for a long time and written for a long time about Métis, Métis work. Um, so I also chose her because I find that in academic institutions, we're often uh, quoting the same people all the time and they tend to be men. And there's lots of male indigenous scholars who are quoted all the time. You'll always hear about Vine Deloria or Thomas King or these other men, um, but Unfortunately, uh, Indigenous women are still um, not seen in the same way. So I purposely chose Sherry because she has been working with this since the 1970s. She also worked with Maria Campbell, 
um, who wrote the book um, about being Métis called Half Breed, which is an amazing book if you can find it. Um, um, yeah. Next, I worked with a woman named Carol Rose. She doesn't use Daniels anymore. She has an indigenous name now. She uh, grew up um, in something called the 60s Scoop. In the 1960s, the Canadian government went into the indigenous communities and took indigenous children and adopted them into um, European or white families. Um, and often they didn't know where they had come from or even that they were indigenous. Sometimes they were told they were other things or, um, so Cheryl, um, Carol, Carol grew up in this way. Um, and she started to uh, re rediscover her culture. She's learned her, a lot of her language and she shares it um, through storytelling, through poetry, and also through performance. She does great things with children's songs in Cree, which is really fun. Um, so I, and she, she, and she just openly shares all of this. And I think that her bravery in living her life and learning her language um, is is a is a true inspiration for for many of us who feel we've lost uh, a part of our culture through colonization. Um, and then the last place I went, <clears throat> I went to um, a protest camp that was set up in my hometown. It lasted for I think it was a little bit over the 188 days that it says there. It was called Justice for Stolen Children. Um, the camp honors children lost to the justice system, such as Colton Bushy, who was a young man shot point blank in the head with a rifle by a farmer, and um, the farmer didn't have to serve any jail time. This also honors children stolen from their families during the 60s scoop and through residential schooling. Uh, the camp was run by all Indigenous women, and um, Indigenous men were um, were there to support, but they didn't have any um, any any role in deciding what happened at the camp. So this was really brave and amazing because in my city, uh, my city has one of the highest levels of racism in Canada against Indigenous people. So for these these Indigenous women to be so brave as to set up these TP camps on um, legislative grounds, this is government property uh, was very brave and it lasted for over 188 days, like I said, and people donated food. And um, at first I went there thinking that as you do when you're told to go out and do um, your master work, you need to ask questions and you need to have a form and you need to do all these things. And, and I went there and thought, <clears throat> how insulting would it be to, to put a form in front of these women who've lost children in a real way? And also, for me as an Indigenous person, they would look at me like I was crazy, like, why are you asking us this? Do you know what's happened <laughs> to us? So I, I've, I've always taken into my, my research work my, um, my perspective and my um, belonging to the community. Uh, I'm not, I have to do things in the way that we do things because I don't come from outside. So I have conversational research with the women. I don't write things down that they say. I don't quote them word for word. I don't record anything. What I do is I take in the conversation and the sharing of the knowledge and we come to something together. And then after I've written something, I share it with them again to see if this is okay and if this is, if this is an agreed upon way that we have created this knowledge. And then we work forward from there. Um, so, uh, at this camp, I was silent. I was, I was welcomed into the main teepee where they did prayers for the children. And I was so overcome with emotion, um, <clears throat> because of my dad's experience and many of my cousin's experiences. And it was just a really loving place to be. And I was very impressed at, at how these women stood their ground for so many days outside in Saskatchewan where it can be quite cold and miserable and um, there's so much racism. They faced a lot of um, 
they face a lot of people coming and being racist towards them and throwing things at them and things like that, but they still persevered. The reason the government took down the camp had nothing to do with the message of the camp, but because they said they needed to mow the lawns. So instead of all these women wanted was for the government to acknowledge what had happened, that there had been this injustice for Colton Bushy, that there had been injustices for, in the 60s scoop and injustices in the Residential Schooling Act. <clears throat> and they wanted an, an acknowledgement of that. And instead, the government just let them stay there. And then, and then one day just said, you know, we have to do the ground, so off you go and remove the teepees. And so after that happened, the women went every day to this, the legislative building with tiny teepees that they had built <laughs> and delivered them there so that they, every day there are teepees being delivered to the legislative building. So they, they still, they still are working on this to try to get some sort of a reaction from the government in my city, acknowledging that these things have happened. The last residential school in Canada closed in 1996. So this is not a history that is very far back for us. Indigenous people were allowed to vote in Canada in 1960. And that was after my dad was born. So this is a very uh, near um, part of our history, the lack of agency and the lack of rights we've had in our own communities and on our own land. Um, so I'm going to move over to this one and I'll just share a tiny bit about Vine Deloria. Um, the article that I shared was called Relativity, Relatedness and Reality. And like I said, he talks, he, he says, we are all relatives. Um, I'm just going to really quickly go through this because I think if you, he, he, it's a really short article and it's really interesting the way he's written it. So if you haven't read it, then it's like, I'll, I'll share this, you have this PowerPoint so you can read it after and I have some questions that you can reflect on after. Um, but he's talking about indigenous ways of knowing and indigenous ways of um, producing knowledge. So he calls part of it harvest by observation. Um, and so I call it another scientific method because um, he's talking about a methodology where of knowing, understand and interpreting the universe and the natural world and the relationships in between. So I have some questions here about um, some of the stories he has. Um, I'll say I'll say one. Um, I'll say a little bit about the one story about the summer hunt. So he talks about how a group would go out to do a summer hunt, but before they left their community, they planted their corn. And so many people would probably question, how do they know when to come back to harvest the corn? Um, and Standing Bear related that it is the relationship between different plants that allowed these indigenous peoples to manu maneuver between harvesting and going in and out of their communities. So when they left for the summer hunt, they planted their corn. And where they went to hunt, there were, mil there were plants called milkweed pods. And they knew that the milkweed pods had just about the same growing time as the corn, a, slight, um, a slightly bit, not exactly the same time. They knew that when the milkweed, milkweed pod started to uh, bloom, then it was time for them to go back and harvest the corn. And so in this way, uh, Vine Deloria is, is sharing that indigenous knowledge, it, it isn't something that just came overnight. This is something that is observed over time. And it, I'm not just observing from the human to plant, relationship or human to hunt relationship but the relationship between the milkweed pods and the corn and the growing times and how these things could be figured out. Um, he also talks about um, respect in the relationship so um, I don't think I have time for this story because it's a little bit more involved but um, the one thing I'm going to say is that I really like the way he uses the term purposeful action to describe the natural world. Because often in a colonial perspective, we uh, think that, or some think that things in, in the natural world just sort of happen and there isn't a meaning, a purposeful action behind it. And so when he's talking about the story of um, the buffaloes in the sunflowers, there he's, there he's saying that the sunflowers 
have made themselves attractive to the buffalo. And in this way, the buffalo spread the seeds of the sunflower. And so I really like this idea of purposeful action in terms of the natural world in a way maybe we can't understand, we don't need to understand because it happens anyway. Um, and so I call his work, I've, <laughs> the, three, the new three R's, uh, reality by the senses, relatedness as a tool for interpretation of all parts of the universe, and relativity of the experience together with interpretation. And, and I'll really, um, I'll really, I really like the way he talks about relativity because he goes into Einstein's notion of relativity and then he brings it into an indigenous perspective. So there's two different, two almost like opposing um, definitions of what relativity is. From, an, from a colonial perspective, often relativity is a sense of distance. Whereas an indi indigenous perspective, it is a connection. Um, and so I find this difference quite interesting and I, I like to work with it and play with it a little bit in my own work. Thank yeah. you so much, Amanda, for this. I mean, I think we can, you know, I could hear you talk for hours and hours yeah. and months and months and years <laughs> to the entire medicine wheel, so. <laughs> I, never, I never really know where to start and it is a long, I can't, it has to involve the history and then there's so much more and and um but i think it's okay to not know where to start sometimes so um, and where, where and we don't let's just say we are not ending here as well no. so anyway you have a few questions there is one by lv lv are you here do you want to ask your question directly lv if you want yes to i am here hey amanda Hi. thank you so much for sharing your knowledge uh, so i have a question on the decolonization of academic institutions Mm -hmm. I'm just going to read out loud what I typed because. Mm -hmm. um, so, what do you think would be a good way for different methodologies, so for example, the indigenous research methods and the Western ones, uh, to exist in relation to each other within academic institutions? And then, added to this, I was asking would, for example, uh, Mabembe's or Gila Mabembe's idea of a pluriversity be something to consider? That's it. Yeah, yeah, I really think that. Um, I really think that, you know, it's not one or the other. I think that we have to blend. Um, and the, the thing that I really try to, that I say to people, because say, people say, I can't, we can't change the academic um, institution or system overnight or maybe ever. Um, but I say, but what I like to do is, is like play with the boundaries. Um, and so as long as I, I can always justify why I'm doing what I'm doing, that is the academic way. And so... Um, I say to people, you can do, it's like sm small things, like my bibliography is mostly Indigenous women and, and also women. I, I, chose to, I chose to reference people whose knowledge has not been highlighted because we just keep, um, or at least my feeling is from what I had seen in my academic experiences that we're just like re-quoting the same people over and over and over again. And those are not the masters. Those are just people that have been favored for some reason. So um, it, it, it was difficult though, I have to say, writing an indigenous, um, using an indigenous methodology in an academic institution, even though I was doing an in indigenous studies program. And I kept saying to the people that we were there with that, this is what we're supposed to do. This is what we're taught to, to work in different ways and include different ways and also make space for different ways and that is that's one of the there's another article i really like by i can't remember his name now but he's worked at the world um at different places but he's talking about making space and so that's that is basically what i'm trying to do all the time and i'm also trying to like i say to people i don't want to or i don't think i can rediscover the wheel in a sense, there are already indigenous women and indigenous researchers out there doing work that should be shared um, and should be quoted above other people. So even though I was in an indigenous studies program and I said I wanted to only use indigenous women in my bibliography, I met resistance with that. And they said, you can't do that. And I, and I was like, why? People often only have men in their bibliographies. 
Um, and they're just, and they said, you can't, you can't say that that's what you're going to do because it would be seen as, I'm not sure what. So I just didn't say it. I just did it. And I just, <laughs> these were the people I quoted from. And I'm not really sure if that answers your question, but I do think that we need, because people often ask me about allies and allyship, and it can't just be me saying these things. <clears throat> I really do feel that um, the academic hierarchy and the hierarchical way of interpreting the world and learning is false and, and it isn't the true way that we exist. And so I think that um, I want everyone to feel that they can have access to so-called indigenous methodologies. Um, and um, if you read Linda T. Smith, she talks, she has really great, she's written a lot about how, how to work within the academic situation and also be an ally, but also expand your, the way of working. So I think it is really difficult. You can't, you can't just break the rules because you will fail and then, or they'll give, they'll say you can't do this or blah, blah, blah. But I just try to push the boundaries. And then I encourage other people I know to also push the boundaries to like, <clears throat> If you're going to quote somebody, make sure to quote somebody that's not always quoted or people of color or women or GBDQ and, and include these other thinkers. Um, I also very much and actually, felt to, that... To remind everybody as well, you have uh, Linda's text uh, into the reading material that was sent into the email. So if you wanted to dive into it as well, you can do that too. Um, Amanda, you do yeah. have another question as well uh, okay, by Jill. Sorry. Jill, are you here? You're asking a question about the medicine wheel and the material cycle. Do you want to pop in the screen or? Is she here? So if she's... Yeah, yeah I think it's really interesting when you talked about seasons. I'm wondering if, like, uh, if there are any stories or if there was anything related to the menstrual cycle and the wheel of medicine like the medicine wheel of you, the cycles were also on the stories of this or? Yeah, there's, there's like, oh my goodness, I could share so many things with you and I, I don't have time for that, but um, <laughs> um, it was often called the women's moon time. And this is when we were thought to have, or not thought, but this is when we were honored in a way because, because of the ability to give and sustain life. Um, and there are many stories related to Grandmother Moon. And so I can share some links with um, Nelly after to send to you about um, how this worked. And, and from, from a colonial perspective, they've often made it seem like the indigenous way people thought about it in a, in a way that it was dirty and they sent women away. And da, da, da. But that is not at all. So, so it's important to like look at it from this indigenous perspective. Um, and um, there's this really great... Um, organization in Canada called um, Native Women's Association in Canada and they have tons and tons of documents related to Grandmother Moon and stories about these sorts of things and the rights of um, or the power of, of women and also to spirit. Can we call we didn't have the same colonial it's really hard for me I can't speak for every indigenous person but as far as I know, we didn't have these same um, binaries in terms of identity of gender. So we also have something called two-spirit, which is, um, there's many stories about that too. <laughs> mm -mm -mm. Thank you, Amanda. There is uh, one more question that I can see here. Like, Alisa, are you there? Alisa Ruza Vina, you're doing a project in Gunayala in Panama at the moment. Yes, I was, to be honest, I was just asking you if you'd be willing to share your email because I have quite a few personal experiences I'd love to speak to you about. And being a, a white Eastern European woman and kind of working and collaborating together with indigenous communities across the world and getting funding from councils that are based yeah. in Europe is, you know, the amount of evaluation papers I had to write that are just completely beyond, you know, how can you give... Yeah. Uh, you know, cultures that don't use writing as a way of communicating, how can you give them forms and record them? It's just so complicated. So yeah. it's more about yeah. research methodologies and collaboration is my question. Yeah, yeah, I could totally share my email. And like what I did with my faculty or 
is that before I went into the field, I made up the little form with like questions <laughs> that I was going to ask the people that I interacted with. But in my culture, I'm also part of it. And it would be highly offensive for me to put a piece of paper in front of say, Sherry Farrell Reset. Say, like I'm related to her, it would be so offensive to say, can you please sign off on this? Can you please say that it's okay? And so before I went into the field, I had all the little things. And then uh, when I came back, I wrote in detail about why I had to throw it out and why it meant um, respecting how those women wanted to um, interact and share knowledge and how um, as my role um, located, I locating myself in the community, I couldn't, get, I couldn't offend these people by acting outside of my culture. Um, so I, I went through the motions in the beginning and then in the field, I just let it happen. And then when I came back, as long as I was able to give references and give reasons as to why I did that, um, they couldn't really argue with me. So I have, a, there's a really great article um, by Joanne Rappaport about co-theorization in the field. And she's, uh, I can't remember where, which community it is, maybe Venezuela, but um, I'll send that one to you because that one is a mine for how to do it with papers and forms and all these things like that. Um, but yeah, I totally know what you mean. And, and, but I did, you know, I did make up the form and I, did, um, I guess, pretend that I was going to ask these, <laughs> sit down and have an interview. Um, but uh, because they knew that the community I was dealing with found those kinds of things to be offensive, it was acceptable for me to use it that way. And then I also, uh, with the research council, shared that I, I had shared the entire thesis with all of the women, and they could take out, take away anything they wanted at any time, even like the second before I submitted my thesis, if they wrote me and said, I want to be out, then I would have taken them out. So I just made it very clear the, the um, cooperation that worked with that we had. So yeah. I don't know if that helps. <laughs> Thank you, Amanda. Thank you so much, Amanda. And with this, I'm going to say uh, thank you all for joining this uh, presentation by Amanda. Uh, you can see some of her material into the reading uh, section, uh, that the, the reading folder. Uh, we really, really are so grateful for you to share uh, your knowledge and your experience of going through academia and I think it's a very important note as well to remember that there is not you know like you say just one form of research uh, there is you know obviously when we started this whole section I started by saying that uh, we had our learning outcome our criteria. I think there is a lot to be said about you know how you can challenge all of those and uh, develop a complete uh, new format uh, that will fit your practice and I think that's the challenge here um, and that's what you you really fantastically well um, you know kind of lay out for us so thank you so much for that have an amazing day uh, and uh, please yes, you, I just wanna... oh hmm? I just wanted to say that um, I'm super willing to share emails or connect with people so please just um, contact me and um, I'm just like super accessible and I really love making connections with people and um, sharing knowledge. So, yeah. So if you want, I can. So, do and I'm, and I'm just going to say, yeah. I can. Uh if you want to include your email into the chat section. But anyway, I'm going to have to ask you all to leave this uh, this conversation because I have to do a, a tech test with one of our speakers in a bit.